Hey class, welcome to our literature subject. We're jumping into Johnny Tremaine. If you haven't watched the introduction, you can go back and do that. It should be here on the same assignment for Canvas, or you can find it on my YouTube channel. That will kind of set the stones and foundation for what the story is about and you know some things that might happen. So that will be a good video to watch before. We're gonna get through chapters one and two in this video. So if you need to take a break, remember to take a uh, remember to do so. Uh, pause the video, go get some water, stretch, and come back when you are ready. All right. So this video is to help you uh, read and follow along. Um, if you are trying to get caught up and behind, those that are maybe watching this video a little bit later, you can just turn the video on and listen to it as you are, you know, eating breakfast or, or getting ready for the day. And that way you can read or listen to the material and get caught up quicker. All right, so chapter one, up and about. On Rocky Island's goal woke, goals woke. Time to be about their business. Silently they floated in on the town. But when their icy eyes sighted their first dead fish, first bits of garbage about the ships and wharves, they began to scream and quarrel. The cocks in Boston backyards had long before cried the coming of day. Now the hens were also awake, scratching and clucking. Cats in malt houses, granaries, ship holds, mansions, and hovels caught a last mouse, settled down to wash their fur and sleep. Cats did not work by day. And stable horses shook their halters and whined. And barns, cows lowed to be milked. Boston slowly opened its eyes, stretched and woke. The sun struck in horizontally from the east, flashing upon weather vanes, brass cocks, and arrows. Here, a glass-eyed Indian. There, a copper grasshopper. And the bells in the steep, uh, steepless, steeples cling clanged, telling the people it was time to be up and about. So right now, just pause a little bit. Uh, we talked about wind vanes and science, and so that might have stood out to you. And then also, this is kind of giving you a picture of what is happening with the, the, you know, the birds in the air, the animals waking, and the kind of the setting of the story. So that's what is just happening. In hundreds of houses, sleepy woman woke, sleepier children. Get up and to work. Ephraim, get to the pump, fetch mother water, and get to the barn, milk the cow, and drive her to the common. Start the fire, Silas. Put on a clean shirt, James. Dolly, if you aren't up before I count to ten. And so, in a crooked little house at the head of Hancock's Wharf on crowded Fish Street, Mrs. Latham stood at the foot of the ladder leading to the attic where her father-in-law's apprentices slept. These boys were luckier than most apprentices. Their master was too feeble to climb ladders. The middle-aged mistress too stout. It was only her bellows that could penetrate to their quarters, not her heavy hands. Boys? No answer. Dove? Coming, ma'am. Dove turned over for one more snooze. Frustrated, she shook the ladder. She was too heavy to climb. She wished she could shake them limbs of Satan. Dusty Miller, let me hear your voice. Here it is, piped Dusty pertly. Her voice changed to pleading. Johnny, you get them two lazy lug of beds up. Get them down here. You pull that worthless dove right out her bed. You give Dusty a kick for me. I'm waiting for him to fetch fresh water so eyes can get on with breakfast. Johnny Tremaine was on his feet. He did not bother to answer his mistress. He turned to the fat, pale, almost white-haired boy still wallowing in bed. You're that dove? Oh, you leave me lay, can't you? Grumbling, he swung his legs out of the bed the three boys shared. Johnny was already in his leather bre uh, breeches, pulling on his coarse shirt, tucking in the tails. He was a rather skinny boy, neither large nor small for fourteen. He had a thin, sleep flushed face, light eyes, a wry mouth, and fair, lank hair. Although two years younger than the Swinish Dove, inches shorter, pounds lighter, he knew, and old Mr. Latham knew busy Mrs. Latham, and her four daughters and Dove and Dusty also knew that Johnny Tremaine was boss of the attic and almost of the house. Dusty Miller was 11. It was easy for Johnny to say, look sharp, Dusty, and, du and little Dusty looked sharp. But Dove, his first name, had long ago been forgotten. Hated the way the younger apprentice lorded it over him, telling him when to go to bed, when to get up, criticizing his work in the silversmith shop as though he were already a master smith. Hadn't he been working four years for Mr. Latham and Johnny only two? 
Why did the boy have to be so infernally smart with his hands and his tongue? Look here, Johnny. I'm not getting up because you tell me to. I'm getting up because Mrs. Lapham tells me to. All right, said Johnny blandly. Just so you're up. There was only one window in the attic. Johnny always stood before it as he dressed. He liked the view down the length of Hancock's Wharf, counting houses, shops, stores, sail lofts, and one great ship after another, home again after their voyaging. Content as cows waiting to be milked, he watched the gulls, so fierce and beautiful, fighting and screaming among the ships. Beyond the wharf was the sea and the rocky islands where gulls nested. He knew to the fraction of a moment how long it would take the two other boys to get into their clothes. Swinging about, he leaped for the head of the ladder, hardly looking where he went. One of Dove's big feet got there first. Johnny stumbled, caught himself, and swung silently above at a dove. At, sorry, above at Dove. Gosh, Johnny, I'm sorry, snickered Dove. Sorry, eh? You're going to be a lot sorrier. I just didn't notice. You do that again, I'll beat you up again. You overgrown pig of a louse, you... He went on from there. Miss, Mr. Latham was strict about his boy swearing, but Johnny could get along very well without. Whatever a pig of louse was, it did describe the wittish, placid, paris, uh, parasitic dove. Little Dusty froze as the older boys quarreled. He knew Johnny could beat up Dove any time he chose. He worshipped Johnny and did not like Dove. But he and Dove were bound together by their common servitude to Johnny's autocratic rule. Half of Dusty sympathized with one boy, half of him with the other in this quarrel. It seemed to him that every boy, everybody liked Johnny. Old Mr. Latham, because he was so clever at his work. Mrs. Latham, because he was reliable. The four Latham girls, because he sassed them so, and then grinned. Most of the boys in the other shops around Hancock's Wharf liked Johnny, although some of them fought him on sight. Only Dove hated him. Sometimes he would get Dusty in a corner, tell him in a hoarse whisper how he was going to get a pair of scissors and cut out Johnny Tremaine's heart, but he never dared do more than trip him and then whine out of it. Some day, said Johnny, his good nature restored, I'll kill you, Dove. In the meantime, you have your uses. You get out the buckets and run to North Square and fetch back drinking water. The Lathams were on the edge of the sea. Their well was brackish. Look here, Mrs. Latham, and Des said Dusty, was to go and get along with you. Don't you go arguing with me. Fetching water, sweeping, helping in the kitchen, tending the annealing furnace in the shop were the unskilled work the boys did. Already Johnny was so useful at his bench, he could never be spared for such labor. It was over a year since he had carried charcoal or a bucket of water touched a broom, or helped Mrs. Latham brew ale. His ability made him semi-sacred. He knew his power and reveled in it. He could have easily made friends with stupid Dove, for Dove was lonely and admired Johnny as well as envied him. Johnny, pre preferred, to be Johnny preferred to bully him. Johnny, followed by his subdued slaves, slipped down the ladder with an easy flop. To his left was Mr. Latham's bedroom. The door was closed. Old Master did not go to work these days until after breakfast. Starting the boys off, getting things going, he left to his bustling daughter-in-law. Johnny knew the old man, whom he liked, was already up and dressed. He took this time every day to read the Bible. To his right, the only other be bedroom was open. It was here Mrs. Latham slept with her four poor fatherless girls, as she called them. The two biggest and most capable were already in kitchen helping their mother. Scylla was sitting on the edge of one of the unmade beds, brushing uh, Encina's hair. It was wonderful hair seemingly spun out of gold. It was the most wonderful thing in the whole house. Gently, Scylla brushed and brushed. Her little oddly shaped face turned away, pretending she did not know that Johnny was there. He knew neither Scylla nor Isana uh, would politely wish him the conventional good morning. He was lingering for his morning insult. Scylla never lifted her eyes as she put down her brush and very deliberately picked up a hair ribbon. The Lathams couldn't afford such luxuries, but somehow Scylla always managed to keep her little sister in her hair ribbons. Very carefully, she began to tie the child's halo of pale curls. She spoke to Isanna in so low a voice it was almost a whisper. There goes that wonderful Johnny Tremaine. Isanna took her cue, already so excited she was jumping up and down. Johnny worth his weight in gold, Tremaine? If you don't think he is wonderful, ask him, Isanna. Oh, just how wonderful are you, Johnny? Johnny said nothing, stood there and grinned. The two youngest Latfums were always insulting him, not only about how smart he was, but how smart he thought he was. He didn't care. Every now and then they would say something that irritated him, and then together they would shout, Johnny's mad. 
As an apprentice, he was a little more than a slave until he had served his master seven years. He had no wages. The very clothes upon his back belonged to his master, but he did not, as he himself said, take much. There are only four real rooms in the Latham house, the two bedrooms on the second floor, the kitchen, and the workshop on the first. Johnny paused in the lower entry. In the kitchen, he could see his formidable mistress bent double over the hearth. Madge in time would look like her mother, but at 18, she was handsome in a coarse grain, red-faced, thick-waisted way. Dorcas was 16, but like Madge, but not so loud voice, nor as roughly good-natured. Poor Dorcas thirsted for elegance. She would rub floor, um, sorry, rub flour on her face, trying to look pale, like the fashionable ladies she saw on the street. She wore her clothes so tight, hoping to look ethereal. She looked uh, apoplectic. How they all laughed when her her stays burst in the middle of a meeting with a loud pop. She did not call her mother ma, but mother or respected mother. In her efforts to avoid the rough, easy speech of her associates on Hancock's Wharf, she talked when she remembered it in a painful, prissy, proper way. Johnny thought Madge pretty bad, and Dorcas even worse, but he was philosophical about them. He wouldn't mind having them for sisters. They certainly were good, hard workers, except when Dorcas tried too hard to be elegant. It, was already been, sorry, it had already been decided that when he grew up to be a really great silversmith, as Mr. Latham said he would, he was to marry Scylla, and together they would inherit Grandpa's silver business. Scylla was just his age. This idea seemed only mildly offensive to both of them. Johnny had no particular objections. Smart apprentices were always getting ahead by marrying into their master's families. He had been flattered when Mrs. Latham had told him that he might marry one of her girls. Of course, Madge and Dorcas, they were fine, big, buxom girls, would make better wives. But he'd but didn't he think they were a little old for him? True, Scylla was just a mite spendy, but she was coming along fine. This Santa was so weakly it didn't seem worth making any plans for her maturity, so it was to be Scylla. Johnny had often heard Mrs. Latham say that Isana was hardly worth the bother she was to raise. The little girl, her beautiful brown eyes wide with interest, never seemed to mind these remarks of her mother, but they made Scylla cry. Scylla loved Isana. She was proud when people stopped her on the street and said, is that little angel your sister? She did not mind that there were so many things Isana could not keep down, like pork, gravy, mince pies, new beer. If Isana got wet, she had a cold. If a cold, a fever. First Johnny, with the customary look sharp, got the sulky dove and his first buckets headed for North Square. Then he took the key to the shop out of his pocket as though he owned it. Dusty, good, and quiet as a mouse followed him. Look sharp, Dusty, Johnny said. Get the um, annealing furnace going. Get to the coal house, fetch in char charcoal. You'll have to do it by yourself. I want to get this bucket mended before breakfast. Already the day's bustle had begun up and down the wharf. A man was crying fish. Sailors were heave-hoeing at their ropes. A woman was yelling that her son had fallen into the water. A parrot said distinctly, King Hancock. Johnny could smell hemp and spices, tar and salt water, the sun drying fish. He liked his wharf. He sat at his own bench before him, the innumerable tools of his trade. The tools fitted into his strong, thin hands. His hands fitted the tools. Mr. Latham was always telling him to give God thanks who had seen fit to make him so good an artisan, not to take it out and lording it over the boys. That was one of the things Johnny did not let bother him much. Dove came back, his thick lower lip thrust out. The water had sloped over his breeches, uh, down his legs. Mrs. Latham does not want you in the kitchen. Johnny did not even look up from his buckle. Nah. Well then, the spoon you finished yesterday afternoon has to be melted down, made over. You beat it to the wrong gauge. Did Mr. Latham say twas wrong? No, but it is. It is supposed to match this spoon. Look at it. Dove looked. There was no argument. So get out the crucible. Soon as Dusty's got the furnace going, you melt it down and try again. I'd like to get you in the crucible, thought Dove, and melt you down. I beat you to the proper gauge. Two years younger than me, and look at him. It was Asana who ran in to tell them that Grandpa was in his chair and breakfast was on the table. The soft brown eyes combined oddly with the flying frere, um, fair hair. She did look, uh, look, sorry, she did look rather like a little angel. Johnny thought, just as people were always telling Scylla on the street, and so graceful. She seemed to flow about rather than run. No one to see her would ever guess the number of things she couldn't keep down. 
Mr. Lapham as befitted, as befitted his uh, venerable years and his dignity as master of the house, sat in an armchair at the head of the table. He was a peaceful, kind, remote old man. Although his daughter-in-law was always nagging him to collect bills, finish work when promised, and discipline his apprentices, nothing she said seemed to touch him. He did not even bother to listen. His dull, groping eyes lingered kindly over his boys as they trooped in for breakfast. Good morning, Dove. Dusty, good morning, Johnny. Good morning, sir. He took his time blessing the meal. He was deacon at the Cockrell Church and very pious. I'm just going to pause really quick and just double check that this isn't chapter two that's starting. If we look at our um, table of contents. Oh, yeah. So this should be our 12 chapters that we're going to be reading. Um, supposed to be just two chapters a week. Right. Um, here, let's pause really quick, guys. Sorry. Um, those are just. I just want to double check my pull up our canvas really quick. And go to our literature section. Go to our modules. And then we should have. Yep, there you go. So those are the chapters, okay? So I'm not totally for sure what this number means. Um, maybe it's Act 2 or something for this section. Okay. All right. All right, so breakfast was good, although no more than a poor artisan could afford. Milk and ale, gruel, sausages, and cornbread. Everything was plentiful and well-cooked. The kitchen was as clean or cleaner than many of those in the great houses. Every member of the household had a clean shirt or petticoat. Mrs. Laffham was a great manager, but she shared nothing for gentle manners and was first to laugh at Dorcas's, If it please you, mother, just a touch more maple syrup for me. Give me that there syrup pitcher was good enough for her. When the meal was over, Mr. Laffham told Madge to hand him the family Bible. Johnny, I'm going to ask you to read, us, read to us today. The three boys only Johnny read easily and well. His mother had lived long enough to see to that. Dev stumbled shamefully. Dusty usually had the first chapter of Genesis, so that by reading the same thing over and over, he might eventually learn. Madge and Dorcas never cared even to try to read. Mrs. Lapham could not so much as write her name. Book learning, she declared. Scalded no pigs. Scylla was so anxious to learn and teach Asana that whenever Johnny read, she leaned over the book and shaped the words to herself as, she, as he said them. They sat beside each other at table to help... To help her, Johnny always kept a finger on the lines as he read. Johnny now opened the book, keeping it between himself and Scylla. Where, sir, shall I read? Mr. Latham's selections for his boys were sometimes as designed to point out some fault in a member of his household, especially in the reader. Dove was always being asked to read about sluggards and going to ants. Johnny was told where to begin in Leviticus. Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image. What was old master driving at? Couldn't a silversmith put a dragon's snout on a chocolate pot? Soon the surging roll of the words, the pleasure of the sound of his voice coming so clearly out of his mouth, made him stop looking for a possible object, object lesson in the text. Scylla was leaning over him, breathing hard in her efforts to keep up. Mrs. Laflam sat agape. Soon she'd be saying it was just like having a preacher live with them to hear Johnny Tremaine read Holy Writ. Finish with the 19 verse, And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Turn to Proverbs 11, second verse. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is a wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now close the book, stand up, and expound to us all the meaning of God's word. Johnny stood up, his skin was thin, and he could feel himself flush. So the old gentleman was after him for his pride again, was he? It is all another way, another way of saying, God's way of saying, that pride goeth before a fall. Yes, and why? Because God doesn't like pride, Johnny sounded sulkily. Do you think God would like you? Not especially. Dusty was the first to snicker. What does God, <clears throat> what does God like? Humble people, and said John, uh, Johnny wrathfully. He sends punishments to people who are too proud. <clears throat> now, Johnny, I want you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Johnny Tremaine, 
I, Johnny Tremaine, swear from this day onward, swear from this day onward, to walk more humbly and modestly before God and man, to walk more humbly and modestly before God and man, just because some folks are not so smart, the old master gave Dove and Dusty a pity, pitying glance. It's no reason why other folks should go around rubbing their noses in their own stupidities. Either Dove or Dusty kicked Johnny under the table. Madge and Dorcas were giggling. Mrs. Laffham was already scraping the trenchers clean, getting on with her work. She did not hold much by Grandpa's soul searchings. The master, followed by Dove and Dusty, left for the shop. Johnny heard Scylla give an exaggerated pious sigh. He stopped. When the meek inherit the earth, she said, I doubt Johnny gets as much as one divot of sod. This was too much for Johnny. He turned on the little girls. When they do, he stormed. Sill, you can just keep about keep your mouth shut until then. You know, you did look pretty funny standing up there and saying all those humble things Grandpa told you to. Miss Santa was almost jumping out of her pinafore in glee. Johnny's mad, she chanted. Johnny's mad. Yes, murmured Sillo. Looking at him critically, you're right, baby dear. His ears are red. That always means he's mad. Johnny's ears are red, squealed Santa. Johnny talked out of the kitchen as stiff-legged as a fighting tomcat. His ears were scarlet. He decided to do nothing that would lay him open to such criticism, sorry, to such criticism for at least a morning, but he couldn't help it. First, he, if he had not jumped on Dusty, the furnace would have gone out. Then he had to explain to his master how badly Dove had done the spoon, although he tried to sound humble. He was soon behaving perfectly naturally, standing over Mr. Lapfoam with his notebook in his hand, reading off exactly how those spoons had been ordered. Mr. Lapfoam was a fine craftsman. His weakness was that he never wrote down what was ordered, or even listened very carefully. If a patron ordered a sauce boat, he would get a fine one, perhaps a month after it had been promised. Sometimes it weighed a little more, sometimes a little less than it was supposed to. Sometimes it had splayed feet with a gar uh, gadroon edge. Had been asked for Mrs. Lapham herself. Had told Johnny he must always be on hand and write down exactly what the order was. This was necessary, but it did seem cheeky to see the 14-year-old boy standing there telling his master what he was supposed to do. Johnny, having started everybody off on his work, even Mr. Lapfum, decided to go to the coal house and see if he should order more coal. It was such things Mr. Lapfum never thought about until too late. There were two baskets of charcoal, at least half another scattered over the floor. That was the other boy's fault. Johnny himself was too valuable to carry charcoal. He started to yell for Dusty, thought better of it, and went to work arranging the dirty stuff himself. When he was a master craftsman, he wasn't going to buy charcoal by the basket. He was going to own his own willows, say out in Milton. That would say, say two pence a basket in a year. He began to figure, and he wouldn't take just any boy whose father or mother wanted him to be a silversmith. He'd pick and choose. He saw himself sitting at his bench, his shop crowded with boys, with mothers, boys, with fathers, all begging to be allowed to work for him. He'd He'd not talk to the parents, only to the boys. What church did they go to? King's Chapel? All right. Describe to me at least one piece of silver you see used every Lord's Supper. If they could not answer that, he'd know they hadn't got silver in their blood. But how could he find which boys had nice hands? Johnny, it was Madge's voice that pulled him out of his rever uh, reverie. He wiped his black hands on his leather breeches and stepped out into the sunlight of the tiny black yard. Backyard. What is it, my girl? He often thus arrogantly addressed his master's granddaughters, really his own mistresses. Ma sent me, Johnny. It's Mr. Hancock himself. He's in the shop ordering something. Stand by and listen or Grandpa will get it wrong. Dorcas next flung himself up upon, too excited to be elegant. Johnny, hurry. Johnny, hurry, hurry. It's Mr. Hancock. He's ordering a sugar basin. Can't you go faster, shake a leg? Miss Anna was jumping about him like a wild thing. Help, help, she shrieked, but it was Scylla who thought to offer him her clean apron for a towel as he washed off the charcoal at the yard pump. Oh, but he must hurry, and there was Mrs. Lapham tapping at him from the kitchen window. Slowly he approached the house, the girls chattering about him. Close to the shop, close to the shop door was a tiny African holding a slender gray horse by the bridle. Johnny noted the Hancock arms on the door of the gig. He felt so good he could not help saying to the black child, Mind that horse doesn't trample over flowers. Sorry. Mind that horse doesn't trample our flowers. There were no flowers in Lapham's yard. Oh no, sir, said little Jehu, rolling his eyes. 
He thought from the attention this boy was receiving from his escorting ladies, he must be a boy of consequence. Johnny slipped into the shop so quietly that Mr. Hancock did not even look up. It was he who owned this great wharf, the warehouses, many of the fine ships tied up along it. He owned sail lofts and shops and also dwelling houses standing at the head of the wharf. He owned the Latham House. He was the richest man in New England. Such a wealthy patron might lift the Laphams from poverty to affluence. Mr. Hancock was comfortably seated in the one armchair which was kept in the shop for patrons. When I'm master, thought Johnny, there are going to be two armchairs, and I'll sit in one. Unobtrusively, Johnny get, got his notebook and pen, pencil. Dove and Dusty were paralyzed into complete inaction. Do something, Johnny muttered to them, determined his master's shop should look busy. Dusty could not take his eyes off the green velvet coat, sprigged white waistcoat, silver buttons and buckles on the great man, but he picked up a soldering iron and nervously uh, dropped it. And to be done next Monday, a week from today, Mr. Hancock was saying, I want it as a birthday present to my venerable Aunt Lydia Hancock. This is the creamer of the set. Only this morning, a clumsy maid melted the sugar, sugar basin. I want you to make a new one. I want it about so high, so broad. Johnny glanced at the delicate, lace-ruffled, gesturing hands, guessed the inches, and wrote it down. Mr. Latham was looking down at his own gnarled fingers. He nodded and said nothing. He did not even glance at the cream pitcher as Mr. Hancock set it down on a workbench. Johnny's hard, delicate hands, so curiously strong and ma uh, mature for his age, reached quickly to touch the beautiful thing. It was almost as much by touch um, as by sight he judged fine silver. It was indeed old-fashioned, more elaborate than the present mode. The garlands on it were rounded <clears throat> out and uh, repose work. Mr. Lapham would have to do the reposing. Johnny hadn't been taught that. He looked at the handle. A sugar basin would have to a sugar basin would have to have two such would have to have two such handles and they would be larger than the one on the creamer. He'd shape it in wax, make a mold. He had cast hundreds of small things since he had gone to work for Mr. Lapham, but nothing so intricate and beautiful as the woman with folded wings whose body formed the handle. He thought he had never seen anything quite so enchanting as this picture. It must have been the work of one of the great smiths of forty or fifty years ago. Although he had not attended to address Mr. Hancock, he had said before he thought, John Connie, sir? Mr. Hancock turned to him. He had a handsome face, a little worn, as though either his health was bad or he did not sleep well. Look at the mark, boy. Johnny turned it over, expecting to see the family rabbit of the great green Mr. Connie. Instead, there was a pellet and an L in a pellet. Your master made the, that creamer 40 years ago. He made the entire set. You made it? He had never guessed there had been a time when Mr. Latham could do such beautiful work. At last, Mr. Latham raised his uh, portaburent eyes. I remember when your uncle, Mr. Thomas Hancock, sir, ordered that set. Make it big and make it handsome, he said. Bigger and handsomer than anything in Boston. As big and handsome as my lady is. Make it as rich as I am. John Hancock laughed. That is just the way my uncle used to talk. He was so sure of his own good breeding, he could laugh affectionately at the rich, quick vulgarities of the uncle who had adopted him, and from whom he had inherited his fortune. He stood up, a tall, slender man who stooped as he stood and walked. The fine clothes seemed a little pathetic. He had a soft voice and a low... <clears throat> sorry. He had a soft voice and low... But you have not yet, as yet, said whether or not you can make my sugar basin for me and have it done on by Monday next. Of course, I thought first of you, because you made the original. But there are other silversmiths, perhaps you would rather not undertake. Mr. Latham was in a study. I've got the time, the materials, and the boys to help. I can get it at right. Sorry, I can get right at it. But honestly, sir, I don't know. Perhaps I haven't got the skill anymore. I've not done anything so fine for 30 years. I'm not what I used to be, and... Although neither of the two men could see the door leading from the hall into the shop, Johnny could. There was Mr. Mrs. Latham in her morning apron, her face purple with excitement, and all four girls crowded about her listening, gesturing at Johnny. Say yes, all five faces, big and little, mouth at him. Yes, yes, yes. So they had forgotten morning prayers, and they wanted him to take charge. We can do it, Mr. Hancock. Bless me, exclaimed the gentleman, not 
custom to apprentices who settled Masters Wild and Masters Pondered? Yes, sir, and you shall have it delivered at your own house a week from today, 7 o'clock, Monday morning. And it's going to be just exactly right. Mr. Latham looked at Johnny grat gratefully. Certainly, sir, I'm humbly grateful for your august patronage. He was not a proud man. He was rel relieved that Johnny had stepped in and settled matters. <clears throat> Mr. Hancock bowed and turned to go, but none of the boys thought to run ahead and open the door for him. So Mrs. Latham, apron and all, barged in, her red arms bare to the elbow, her felt slippers flapping at her bare heels, and did, or overdid, the courtesies for them all. Hardly was the door closed than there was a rap on it. Little Jehu came mincing in, a glitter of bright colors. He solemnly laid three pieces of silver on the nearest bench and recited his piece. My master, Mr. John Hancock, Esquire, bids me these leave these coins, one for each of the poor work boys, hoping they will drink his health and be diligent at their benches. Then he was gone, hoping they will vote for him when they are uh, when they are grown up and have enough property. Don't you ever vote for Mr. Hancock, sir? asked Johnny. I never do. I don't hold much with these fellows that are that are always trying to stir up trouble between us and England. Maybe English rule ain't always perfect, but it's good enough for me. Fellows like Mr. Hancock and Sam Adams calling themselves patriots and talking too much, not reading God's word like their parents did, which tells us to be humble. But he's my landlord, and I don't say much. Johnny was not listening. He sat with the pitcher in his hand to think the poor, humble old fellow once had been able to make things like that. Well, he was going to turn the trick again before he died, even if Johnny had to stand over him and make him.